Good morning, good morning. Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to the Miracle Morning live stream broadcast. The purpose of these live streams is to strengthen the body of Christ. And we are praying this morning that this message is going to be a blessing to your life. Amen. I feel the presence of God already. Whoa. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Today is Friday, October the 18th. 2024 is the year. That's the secular calendar. Now on God's kingdom calendar, it is the 16th day of the month of Tishrei in the biblical year 5785. We are in the second day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Praise the Lord. Not sure, just a bunch of balloons just went across the screen right now on Instagram. I've never seen that before. I'm not sure what that's about, but it's a celebration. Amen. I'll take it as that. It is a celebration. The Feast of Sukkot is a celebration. I'm looking at my wife right now. My wife greets all of you as well. Literally on the Instagram live, just these balloons just covered the whole Instagram live. And so it is definitely a feast to rejoice. It is definitely a joyful time in the Lord. The Feast of Tabernacles. Come on, somebody. And so we're praying. We believe that this morning's message is going to be a blessing to you. Amen. Um, it's just after 7 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh Right now we're live on Facebook, we're live on Instagram. I feel like I'm already getting caught up in his presence. And so, just uh, as people are logging in right now, we're going to take some time, we're just going to pray, we're going to go before the Lord, and just invite his presence to be felt on this live stream today, that the presence of Holy Spirit would just come forth, Amen. Also, as you people, as as people are logging in, let us know where you're logging in from, and uh, if you would just let me know that you can hear me clearly. That would be helpful, amen. And so, let's just take some time to pray this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We bless your name, Lord. We bless your name, Father. We thank you, Lord. We enter into your gates this morning, Father, with thanksgiving. We thank you, Lord, that we can enter in to your tabernacle, the tabernacle of your presence, Father. And we can enter in and abide with you and have sweet fellowship with you, Father. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you are everything we need. You're everything we need, Father. And we bless your name this morning because you've filled us with your very spirit. You've filled us with your Holy Spirit. And you've given us the ability to communicate with you by your spirit. So this morning, Father, we receive fresh mercies from your throne room. This morning, Father, we receive your love. And Lord, what a privilege it is to be a child of you, the Most High God. What a privilege it is to be part of your royal priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek, through the blood of Jesus, Lord. We pray this morning, Father, that you would release manna from heaven, that you would speak to us by your Spirit. Lord, I just pray right now that you would anoint my mouth afresh as I yield myself over to you, Lord. I pray that you would speak freely, that you would minister to your people, Lord. You know the needs. That you would release a word in season. All we need is one word from you, Father, and everything can change. 
One word from you can change everything. Shakataya basata basata. We just pray this morning, Lord, over those who are dealing with a broken heart. We just pray this morning, Father, those who are dealing with maybe bouts of depression or loneliness. We just lift up those, Father, that are in dealing with illness in their body today. We pray, Lord, that they would receive a healing touch from you. We thank you, Lord, that you have predestined us. You have ordained specific moments in our lives for destiny to come forth, Lord. And we sense that we are in a season of destiny with you, Lord. We thank you, Father, for your faithful love. We thank you, Father, because your love, it endures forever. We receive your love this morning, Father. We receive your favor. Father, we just bless your name because you are a good and loving Father. We just pray right now, Lord, for those who may be recently lost loved ones. We just lift them up. I just pray right now that you would comfort them, Lord. That you would bring comfort to them. In Jesus' name. We pray today, Lord, that you would open up the windows of revelation. That you would reveal the sweet things from your word to our hearts that you would minister to us this morning, Father, by your spirit. We bless your name, Lord. We thank you. We worship you, Lord, on this feast of Sukkot, the feast of tabernacles, Lord. We enter into the tent of meeting in this feast. In the spirit, we enter into the tent of meeting, Lord the Ohel Moed, to meet with you, Father. And we pray, Lord, that as we meet with you over these next couple of days in the Feast of Tabernacles, that we would receive impartation, that we would receive fresh vision, fresh fire, Lord. I sense, Father, that you are reigniting the flame in many of us. You're reigniting us to a fresh new place. You're putting a fresh fire in our walk, Lord. And we ask you for fresh oil this morning. Fresh oil this morning, Lord. We ask that you bless this teaching, this time together this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Would you turn your Bibles with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 27 or the 27th Psalm. Now, I'm going to read verses 4, 5, and 6 out of the New King James Version. I planned on uh, bringing today's message out of all three verses, 4, 5, and 6. But as I got with God this morning, He emphasized verse 4 to me. Psalm 27, verse 4. And so, We're going to stay there. We're not going to go beyond that, but I'm still going to read verse 5 and 6 just for continuity this morning. And so Psalm 27, verse 4, 5, and 6, it says, One thing I have desired of the Lord. This is King David. He says, That I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. Verse 5. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up 
above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. And so I am becoming more and more fascinated with King David. God is just opening up a fascination in my heart for to study the life of this man of God, this Hebrew king, King David, who went from being a shepherd boy to being the king of Israel. A man of God, mighty in the spirit and mighty in battle. I'm fascinated by his life. I'm fascinated by his love for the Lord. And he wrote this psalm, okay? And listen to King David's heart. Listen to his mind. It will it will blow you away. It's no wonder why God identifies David as the apple of his eye. The Lord's anointed, King David. This is so powerful. There are times in my life where God has spoken a scripture to me. And they become what, what I like to call a life verse. Okay, some of you have had that same experience. It's like when you've been in a, maybe a dire situation in your life and you're seeking the Lord and all of a sudden he, the Lord gives you a scripture and that scripture just breaks you out of that season you were in. That, that scripture brought you hope. That scripture catapulted you forward. I've had two of those and now I've had three. I was telling my wife, I have a new life verse. I've had two. I study the scriptures, but when I say life verse, I mean like these are yours. What I mean by that is like God, he spoke it to you. And it went deep, deep, deep into your spirit. And you know that it's something that God is giving you the strength and the grace to live out. A life verse. Some of you have life verses already. Maybe you don't realize it. But it's that one verse that you you seem to go back to. Every time you're dealing with something, you seem to go back to, this, to these one or two scriptures. Those are your life verses. God has given you those. And so I'm so excited because last night god spoke this scripture to me psalm 27 verse 4 and it now it is now going to be my third life verse okay and obviously i have to meditate on it and study on it much more but god has already i'm going to give you what god gave me concerning this okay but Psalm 27, verse 4, King David says this. He starts off by saying this. He says, One thing I have desired of the Lord. One thing I have desired of the Lord. King David had one main thing that he desired of God. Let me say that again. King David had one main thing thing that he desired of God one and now before I go any further in this morning's message I want to ask those of you that are going to hear this message I want to ask you this question what is your one thing what is your one Thing, the one thing that you desire from God. What is it? Everybody has a one thing. Every, this is how God was ministering to me. Everybody has 
a one thing. Imagine all the believers on the earth, we, we, we pray to, to the Father, we pray to God. And we petition him concerning different things. Right? Only you know what what your prayer life is like between you and God. But everybody has one main thing that they seek God for. Right? David had one main thing that he wanted from God. And it's so powerful because if you can catch this, it will change your life. Okay? So I want you to hang on to that thought. What is your one thing? And be honest with yourself. What is your one thing? What is that one thing that you desire from God? What is that? Now let's keep going. King David said, One thing I have desired of the Lord. And then he goes on to say, That I will seek. He's saying, I'm going to seek this one thing that I desire from God. I'm going to become laser beam focused on this one thing that I want from God. What is it? What's David's one thing? He says it in the next line. He says that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. That's David's one thing. And it is so powerful. His one thing is that he his desire his number one desire is to be able to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life. Then he goes on to say, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Now listen, the one thing that David desired of God above everything else was to dwell in God's presence. That's what David desired. That was his one main thing. He said, God, the, the one thing I want from you is the ability, the grace to be able to dwell in your presence all the days of my life. I want to be able to dwell in your presence. This is what I want. Because he said to dwell in the house of the Lord. The house of the Lord is what kept the Ark of the Covenant. And in those days, the Ark of the Covenant was housing the presence of God. So this is so powerful if you can catch this this morning. Because David was mighty because he was a presence dweller. Everything that you're ever going to read about David. The good things about David. Because he was a man and he had some shortcomings still. But God calls him a man after his own heart. But all of the good things that you will learn and study about King David. They come out of this. They come out of his number one desire. To dwell with God. To dwell in the presence of, of God. He was a presence dweller. Now the Feast of Tabernacles. The number one concept of the Feast of Tabernacles. Is dwelling in the presence of God. And David had was a master of this. This is one of the. You could say a, one of the secrets of his life. To his greatness was that he was a presence dweller. He dwelt in the presence of God. David knew how to access God's presence. He knew how to access God's presence. I'm going to tell you right now, in the world that we're living in, 
They can fabricate a lot of things. AI can fabricate and construct and concoct different things. But the number one rarest commodity, mark my words, that will be on the face of the earth, and it already is, is the presence of God. Because the presence of God, I'm going to say something that might sound a little controversial. But the presence of God is not everywhere. The presence of God manifests when there's a person or where there's people that know how to apprehend his presence, who know how to reverence his presence, who know how to honor his presence. But in his presence is the fullness of life. In the Lord's presence is healing. In the Lord's presence is everything that you need. And David knew how to access the Lord's presence. And he was one who loved the presence of God. His number one desire was to be able to dwell in the presence of God all the days of his life. This is what David lived for. He lived for this. He lived for this. What do you live for? Everyone's going to have different answers. What is it that you live for? People say, I live for this. I live for that. I live for this thrill. I live for that. What David lived for was to dwell in the presence of the Lord. How powerful is this? This was his heart. This was the sincerity of his heart. David wanted the freedom in life to be able to spend time with God in his presence. Let me say that again. David wanted the freedom in life to be able to spend time with God in his presence. Now, people talk about things like financial freedom. You hear this phrase thrown around a lot. Financial freedom, the road to financial freedom. And that's, that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. But let me just, let me ask a question here. If money was never an issue for you again, if money was never an issue for you again, what would you do with the liberty of your time? Because most of the, the biggest chunk of our time involves going to work, right? To get a paycheck, to pay for the mortgage, to pay for the rent, to pay for the utilities, to pay for bills, to pay for the vehicle insurance, right? That's the biggest chunk of our time is going to the workplace to get a check to pay these bills. Now, let's just say you walked into a miracle. Just go with me. And you obtained financial freedom. Okay. And money was no longer something, was no longer an issue. Money was no longer a concern. You had all the money to pay the rest of your bills for the rest of your life. And now you have time to do whatever it is you want. My question this morning is, if you had that time now to do whatever you wanted, what would you do 
with your time? This is a serious question. This question came to me this morning in my time with the Lord. You know, maybe some people watch certain certain TV shows. I, I we don't even we don't even have a TV. Like I I don't know what shows are on anymore. Okay, but I just remember certain shows where on the show there would be these particular people and some of them they just had they inherited wealth. Right? They inherited wealth where they did, they just didn't work. Like they didn't need to work. They already had money to live. And people look at that and they go, wow, I wonder what that would be like to live a life where money was never a concern. And I've met people like this. I've met people where their their family owned an enterprise and they just They were just, they were part of the, that, that family's wealth. And they just, they lived in the, in the wealth of that family. And people look at, people look at people like that and they go, wow, I wonder what it would be like to not have to think about money. To just know that money, that, that those, the finances are there. Now, if that was you, what would you do with all your time? What would you do with it? Because David's heart was in the right place. His heart was in the right place. God situated David's life in such a way that he gave David the freedom and liberty of of his time. Because God knew that all David wanted was to spend time with him. That's what David wanted. He wanted to spend time with God in his presence. You see, it's one thing to run to God when you're in trouble. Most people do that. Even people who say they don't believe in God. If they find themselves in a dire situation... Most of them will end up crying out to God. I know this. Okay. Fourteen years working in in the back of an ambulance. I know this. Even people who say they don't believe in God. when, when, When you're going to a hospital with lights and sirens in the back of an ambulance. And your life is on the threshold people find a way to to look up and cry out to the Lord so it's one thing to run to God when you're in trouble and that's not a bad at least at least you're you're running to the right place okay or or people people go through a very hard time in their life you know, something very painful, maybe like a divorce or the loss of a loved one. The best thing is to turn to God instead of alcohol or other substances to try to numb the pain. But it's one thing to run to God when you're in trouble. Okay. But it's a whole other thing when your heart is just devoted to God in every season of life. That's a different, that's a different manner of life. Okay. Are you catching what I'm saying? David was not the guy that only ran to God when he was in trouble. Every time David was in trouble, he ran to the Lord. Okay. But he was not only running to God when he was in trouble. David lived a lifestyle. This was his manner of life. Where his heart was devoted to God in every season of his life. And sometimes it will be the tough circumstances that we live through. 
Sometimes it will be the pressures of life that will thrust you into the arms of God. But the question is, after you have that encounter with God, will you make it your lifestyle to pursue Him every day? Will that become your manner of life? Will your heart become devoted to pursuing God in every season of your life, no matter the weather, good or bad? That your heart is set and focused on pursuing God. This is, this is a realm, a dimension that if you begin to walk in this your life will change forever your life will change forever but there's a, there's a moment see there's got to be a moment and everybody will have that moment where you will experience god you will have an encounter with god but the question is are you some people just kind of just they just chalk it up to like, wow, that was something strange or that was, that was weird or what was that? Or I felt something, but that was the Lord. Okay. And then, and they just kind of walk away from it and never pursue it again. Then there's others who in time, in tough times turn to God and God's right there. And they have an encounter with the living God, like Moses at the burning bush. And then that one moment becomes the defining moment of their life. That, that moment where they encounter the Lord, like Moses at the burning bush, becomes a defining moment. And their life is never the same again. Because their heart is set on fire for God now. Their heart is set on, on, on the things of God now. That's what happened to me. If I share my own personal testimony, that's what happened to me. I grew up going to church. But it wasn't until I was an adult. At a certain moment in my life when I turned to God. And He was right there and I had an encounter with the Lord. And I felt the presence of God. And I felt His love. And I made a decision in my heart. I said, this is better than anything that the world can offer me. I would rather have this. I would rather have this one thing. The presence of God. And someone would say, how could... How could a person walk away from everything... For an invisible God. Friends, let me tell you, you may not be able to see him with your natural eyes, but anybody who's truly experienced God can tell you he is very real. This is why the Bible says we don't walk by faith, but we walk by sight. And there is even a tangible presence at times with the Lord. And he becomes more real than anything you've ever experienced in your lifetime. And so David had a heart that was focused on God. You know, we hear it, we hear it thrown around a lot today in today's culture. You know, God first. People even say things like man of God, things like that. But, but really though, really, what does that really mean? What it really means is that a person's heart, the person's heart has become fixated on God. It has really become the one desire of that person's heart is to seek God, is to dwell with God in His presence. 
And what does that mean? That means that that all the other desires of the world have lost their grip. All of the other desires of this world no longer have a hold on you. Why? Because your love for God has become greater than the things of this world. And all of a sudden, here comes the supernatural power of God. And He liberates you from the cares of this world. And you enter in to a lifestyle of His presence. And it's a supernatural thing. It's a sacred, it's a special thing. But I'm going to tell you, there's a remnant company on the earth that are going to be like David's. They're going to say, the one thing I desire is to dwell in God's presence. I'm not concerned about this or that or that or this. Only one thing I want, God, I just want to be able to dwell in your presence. I want to be able to spend time with you. I want to know you. I want to learn of you. I want to spend time with you in your glory, in your presence. Amen? This was David's heart. This was David's mind. This is what distinguished David. This is why God told the prophet Samuel. He said, I've rejected Saul. And I've found one. One of the sons of Jesse that I've chosen to be my next king. Now, why did God reject Saul? Saul was not a Saul's heart was not about God's presence. Saul's heart was on concerned about other things. Saul was not a presence dweller. Saul's one thing was not to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That was not Saul's one thing. This is the difference between David and Saul. Yet God finds a a little shepherd boy whose heart was fixed on God. All David wanted was the Lord. All he wanted was to To be in the presence of God. And it got God's attention. So much so that God said. This is going to be the next king right here. Why? Because he's a man after my own heart. This is why God told Samuel. The prophet Samuel. He said when you go. Don't look at outward appearance. God said. I don't look at people the way humans do. Humans look at outward appearance, the aesthetics of a person. But God says, I see people, I look at their hearts. Amen. And you can tell a person's heart by the manner of life that they live. Amen. And so I was studying this and I was spending time with God on this scripture this morning. Psalms 27 verse 4. And listen to what the rabbis, listen to what the Hebrew sages write concerning this scripture here and King David. They write, It is in man's nature for his wants to change in accordance with his station in life. In other words, depending on where a man is at in life, his what he wants will change. They say that's that's in a man's nature. Okay. It is in man's nature for his wants to change in accordance with his station in life. 
And they go on to write, The desires of a rich man are different than the wants of a pauper. Okay? So they're saying what, what, what a rich man desires is different than what a pauper desires. Okay? The pauper just probably just wants something to eat, somewhere to sleep. A rich man would have different desires because he's not, he has food to eat. He's got a palace to sleep in. Okay. But then they go on to write, the Hebrew sages go on to write, but David says, one thing I have asked of the Lord, when I was a herder of sheep, and the same thing will I seek also now that I am king. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. That's powerful, right? What are they saying? They're saying that David's heart was like this. That when David was a sheep herder. When David was a, a, a boy taking care of sheep. His desire was to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life. And then when David became king, his desire was to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life. In other words, David's main thing remained his main thing. In other words, his status or his position in life did not change his one desire. His one desire remained. All he wanted was to dwell in God's presence. This is a character trait that's known as equanimity. Equanimity. What this means is that you're a balanced person. What this means is that this is a perfect example of it. David had equanimity in this sense. And that his main thing remained his main thing. Whether if he if he was a despised herd shepherd boy, or if he was the beloved king of Israel, it didn't change his his heart was always the same. His heart was to dwell in God's presence. That was his heart, and that didn't change. You know, in in pop culture. It's popular in pop culture to, to say things like, I haven't changed. You know, I haven't changed. I'm still the same. I haven't changed. There, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of pride that's taken in that. I haven't changed. You know, I'm, I'm the same. I haven't changed. Well, look, David can say that in the most powerful way. Because some people need to change, okay? Some people, they need to change. But it needs to be changed to this right here, to this one thing. This one focus is to, is to be with God, is to dwell in the presence of the Lord. This is what made David great. See, because when David went to the battle line and saw Goliath, he still had the one, still had his one desire of his heart was to dwell with the Lord. Okay, but it's out of the presence of God where courage comes forth. It's out of the presence of God where strength and might comes forth. This is how David was able. To do these things because he spent time in God's presence. And that presence and that impartation and that anointing enabled David to go forth and be valiant for the Lord. Amen? One thing, say that, say one thing, say one thing. This is powerful, right? This is how the Lord was. The Lord was ministering to me this morning like this. One thing. 
What is, here's one more question. What is the one thing that you want more than anything else in the world? What is it? What is the one thing that you want more than anything else in the world? That's a powerful question. I bet if someone did a social experiment and just ran, went around asking people, what's the one thing that you want more than anything else in the world? You would probably get a vast variety of answers. But listen, David's heart for God was so touched by God that David's one thing was to spend time with God. When God truly and sincerely becomes your one thing, your life will change forever. When God, I'm going to say it again, when God truly and sincerely becomes your one thing, your life will change forever. But see, I believe that for most of us, there may be that one rare person who is born with just this innate, just complete desire to just snuff everything out and just zone in on God. But for most of us, even David, I believe, because David was rejected by his family. David's own father rejected him. His own dad, his own brothers rejected him. But see, it was the rejection of his family that thrusted him into the arms of God. And when David was in the arms of a loving father, his heavenly father, David said, this is what I desire, and I don't want anything else. This is what I want. See, for most of us, it's the trials in our life that cause us to run into the arms of our Heavenly Father. So I would say... Don't despise those trials. They were just the catalyst that catapulted you into your heavenly father's arms and then you discovered the presence of the Lord. And now you have become a presence dweller like David. Now you have become one who desires only one thing. And that's to dwell in the presence of the Lord. If you start talking like this with most people, even people in the church. If you start having this conversation, most people are just, they're not ready for it. They're not ready for it. They're not ready for this. Why? Because I believe that God will put you on a journey in life. Or maybe just, or maybe even things that the enemy sent your way. Because what the enemy meant for evil, God will turn it for good. Okay? But however, however it lands, your journey in life. You know, some people turn to, to alcohol or substance abuse. But your journey in life. If, if there's that ever that one pivot where you turn to God and you have that encounter like Moses turned and he had that encounter with God at the burning bush, his life was never the same. That's why most people, this conversation, if they have not been to that part of the journey yet, 
they will not understand this type of talk. Because they're like, yeah, no, I love God. Yeah, I go to church. Yeah, I go to church. I go to church on Sundays or we go to church when we can. Yeah, we love God. No, that's not where David was at. David was in a whole different realm. He was in a whole different dimension. David was in a place where he was literally, he was accessing God's presence, the mind of God, the heart of God. And David lived in a realm where this is all he wanted. Are you catching this? I'm I'm doing my best to our, to communicate this, the depth of this message. It's so deep. It's hard to communicate in words. And God literally just gave me this scripture last night. So obviously I'm going to spend years meditating on this scripture and it will it will get deeper and deeper for me. But this is the essence of it right here. This is, this is why David was so disconnected from the world. Here's a word right here. This is a word right here. It's coming to me right now. The reason why David was so disconnected from the world is because he was so connected to God. And, 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 and at moments of David's life when he lost his connection, that's when you see a man falter. But we stay, but when we stay, you got to stay plugged in. And David lived there. And that's what God considers the greatest, the number one attribute for kingship. The number one trait or attribute that God desires to see in a man or a woman for kingship is that right there, what we just talked about this morning. Is that their heart was focused on the things of God. See, there are people who are praying for a spouse right now. But God is still waiting to become your one thing. There are people who are praying for a spouse today. Like, this is your prayer. God, I want a spouse. God, I want a spouse. But I'm going to tell you right now. God is still waiting to become your one thing. God is not going to give you send you a spouse. I mean you might find one, but God's not going to send one to you. The one he wants, the one that he's going to send to you. That's not going to happen until he becomes your one thing. Why? Because if you get a spouse prior to Desiring God as your main one, your main thing, the presence of God, then what's going to happen is when that spouse comes, they're going to fill that spot in your life that only God is supposed to occupy. Only God is supposed to occupy that space. Okay. This is what happened with, with me and my wife. I'm thankful that I have a wife who her one thing she desires is to dwell in the presence of the Lord. Okay, because that's my one thing I desire is to dwell in the presence of the Lord. So I can't expect my wife to fulfill this space in my life that only God is designed to fulfill. And likewise, my wife cannot expect me to fulfill the space in her life that only God is designed to occupy. I will never be able to fill the void of what God is, only God is designed to fulfill in her life. 
I will, I do not have the capacity to do that. And I'm not designed to. Humans are not designed to. There's a place where in a marriage, a husband and wife become joined as one. And there is a space where each other fulfills in each other's life. But there's a premier spot that only God can fulfill. That's kind of deep. And. Wow. I think this is why. Maybe. See I'm telling you. The way God designed us, he designed us in a way where he is supposed to be first and foremost. He is supposed to fulfill a certain part of our life. The one thing. This is why you see so many people running off and doing all these things. What they're really trying to do is they're trying to fill that spot with other things. This is why people get so obsessed with certain things. They get so obsessed with 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 money or they get so obsessed with 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 cars or so obsessed with you name it. They get obsessed. Some people, I'm just going to say, they even get obsessed with sports teams. They get obsessed with it. Get tattoos of it. Like they get obsessed with it. People aren't going to like me for this, but I believe it's really just their nature really trying to fulfill that spot. But And it's only designed for God to fulfill. This is why you see celebrities so many times, they say it so many times ago, they had everything, but they said, I had, and I never felt so empty. Why? Because they think thought that those things can bring fulfillment but then they said but then they realized I still feel empty but I even feel more empty now because I actually have all the things but they don't realize it but they're actually missing the main thing amen the Lord is on this broadcast this morning the Lord is on here see so people are on their grind they're on their hustle for so many things, so many different things, okay? But but God is still waiting to be your one thing. He's waiting to be your one thing. I believe this is the question of the hour, my brothers and sisters. The question of the hour that God is asking everyone is this one question. When will I become your one thing? Father, we pray today. We thank you, Lord, that you're teaching us your ways. You're instructing us. You're guiding our hearts. You're directing. You're showing us the way, the direction that you want our hearts to flow. And Lord, we want to be like David. We want to be like David, Lord. Where David said one thing he desired. And that was to dwell in your presence all the days of his life. Lord, we pray today that you help us to come into alignment with this word. That our one thing would be like David. That we would seek first your kingdom, your presence, your righteousness. And if we put that number one in our life sincerely and authentically, we're going to see all the other things just by default fall into their proper place. And Lord, we declare that you are. the number one supreme 
reason of our life. You are our purpose. It's in you, Lord, that we live, that we move, that we have our very being. Father, I pray for myself that this word would explode in my heart. We ask you, Lord, for understanding and revelation that you would unpack the depths of this word. That you would remove the layers of our hearts that might be impeding or obstructing us from walking into a dimension where you are the one thing. Lord, we pray for the grace for our hearts to become focused on you like never before. Because we know that the days are coming where distractions like they already are are flooding the earth, Lord. And the enemy will use distraction to cause people to miss what you're doing on the earth. So we pray, Lord, that you would help us to remain focused on you, to keep you as our main thing. You are our mighty God. In you is everything that we need. And we pray today, Lord, that we would dwell in your presence, that we would dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of our lives, Lord, that we would behold your beauty and that we, we would inquire of you, that we would never become complacent, Lord, that we would never become too familiar with your presence, but that we would be keeping like a childlike awe concerning your presence, Lord. And Lord, I pray today that you release a fresh fire in our hearts, a fresh fire fire in our walk, Lord, that you would pour out fresh oil on us and that you would ignite us to a new place. I just hear the Lord saying this right now. And some people are saying, it's like the Lord is tugging on your heart. The Lord is tugging on your heart to walk into this realm that he's been teaching on this morning by his spirit. But you're going like, but I don't know anybody who lives like that I don't know my family they're not going to understand me anymore nobody's going to really get me anymore I just hear the Lord saying this but the Lord says don't worry about that God says I'll bring you like fellowship I'll bring you others who are also walking with God in this manner who are passionately pursuing the Lord he'll bring he'll bring people to you like that I'm looking at my wife right now I remember when God kept calling me deeper and deeper and deeper into his presence and I kept going like I'm going to keep saying yes but the more and more the further and forth further and further I go with God it's like the more and more I knew that I'm just going to say even like people in church would not really be able to fully get me because not everybody's willing to go there with God. And I remember literally telling my mother one day, I said, Mom, I'm just going to go after God. I'm not going to worry about you know, even a spouse, or anything. I'm just going to give that to the Lord. Because I even thought that, I'm like, what girl is going to be able to understand me if I keep going further and further out there with God? And I just said, God, I'm going to follow you. And I'm just going to trust, because I wanted to be married. I wanted a wife. I said, I'm just going to trust that you're going to bring me a wife that's going to be able to understand me. And I just went after God. And sure enough, at the right time, God just brought her. And guess what? She's just as weird as me. <laughs> guess what? 
She's just, she, she just wants God just as much as I do. Amen. I tell her that. I go, you're just as weird as me. <laughs> but no, in all, in all, in all truthfulness, there's, there's, I joke about it, you know, I, cause I don't want to take, take it so like, take myself so serious, but it is a serious thing. And the truth is there's nothing weird about it. It's actually the culture that we live in has become so complacent that now when you choose to walk with God, you become like the anomaly. You become like the one that everyone, like people like they don't get you. But all you're doing is just walking in the design that God truly intended. It's just that the culture has fallen so far away from God that when somebody actually walks with God, it looks so different. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Amen. So listen, we pray that this morning's word was a blessing to you. I have a new life verse. Okay, I have a new life scripture, people. Psalms 27, verse 4. That's my, my third one now. My life verse. One thing I have desired of the Lord, and that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. Amen. God bless you guys on this Feast of Tabernacles. Have a blessed weekend. We will see you guys Monday morning again. It will still be the Feast of Tabernacles. We'll continue in this Monday morning at 7 a.m. Share this with somebody that God puts on your heart uh, to receive this word. Okay. Uh, we love you guys. More importantly, Jesus loves you. And always remember it. You were born to roar and destined to soar. God bless you guys.